With chapter 161 of Chainsaw Man, the moment that we've finally been waiting for during the majority of part two of Chainsaw Man, which is the moment where Mitaka finally learns the truth about Denji being Chainsaw Man, and boy oh boy, now that that moment is here, it did not disappoint at all. To say that this is a record scratch moment in the story, it is a total understatement because this is up there with the reveal that Makima was indeed a devil after so many hints in the story and this reveal did not let us down at all. However, However, let's back things up and let's unpack the chapter itself because man, there's a lot going on here. So we open up with the surgeons who are cutting up Denji. They finally finished up their work with all the boxes that have Denji's body packed away inside of it. And just as they begin to relax a little bit, the door bursts open, knocking all the boxes on the ground. And right away, you know that this chapter was going to have the chaos that you expected from something Chainsman related. And it did not disappoint at all. Katana Man threatens to cut every everyone up in the room if they don't follow his orders and as they're shaking for their lives Fami is already scouting the area saying that Chainsaw Man should be here. This of course prompts Yoru to demand the surgeons to tell them where Chainsaw Man is and that's where we learn that Chainsaw Man is in the boxes and it baffles Yoru to no end. Now this might seem odd to you but it does make a lot of sense when you stop to think about it and it makes you wonder what else public safety had in mind because Denji's body just got caught up and dismembered like we were told happened with the gun devil where the Soviet Union found his body and it cut it up into many pieces and it spread them out amongst various nations with large chunks of the body going to the US, the Soviet Union, and China, and the rest of the body itself was spread out throughout the world. Now, obviously, as of this point in the story, we don't know if that was something they're playing with Denji, but that is something that you should follow away in your head for later on as we move through the story itself. This leads to the students and the surgeons under the pressure from Mitaka and Katana Man putting the pieces back together of Chainsaw man and we get the biggest WTF moment tease in this chapter which is when they find the heart of Pochita it leads to nothing. Now a big part of Chainsaw Man part one as you'll recall was everyone was after Pochita's heart and we had that heartbreaking line where Denji thinks that Reze has no feelings for him and he says why does everyone only want my Chainsaw Man heart? What about my Denji heart? How come nobody wants my Denji heart? Makima went through several carefully crafted schemes to get her hands on Denji to force him to the point of breaking also she can get her hands on Pochita's heart. We then get more of the classic zany Chainsaw Man dark humor with that dark twist to it that made me choke my protein shake when I read it because of how hard it made me laugh. Katana Man, when he gets told that one of the guys found Denji's wiener, he proceeds to take a page out of the Rocks book and he tells him to shine it up real nice, turn it sideways and shove Denji's wiener up his rear end. And I thought the double layered humor here was absolutely classic and spot on. Number one, it's an indirect way to say Denji can go F himself, but also when you go back to the Fumiko situation when they're on that date, what did Denji get all super excited about? It was Fumiko touching his wiener. Now, Denji has another guy touching his wiener. Unless Denji is into some stuff that doesn't involve girls, then I get the feeling that he might not be too excited about this turn of events, which makes this whole situation that much more hilarious. However, this is where Fujimoto begins to start setting us up for more of the ripping out of our hearts. Katana Man and Yoru and the Nail Fiend, they're all talking about love and Yoru being a little too bratty reveals that she knows everything that there is to know about love when the Nail Fiend says that she can't truly understand what love means because she's still in school. This immediately should make you think back to Mitaka and Denji's date and how Yoru took over Mitaka's body and almost kissed him before Nayuta came out of nowhere to send those control chains through her skull and make both Mitaka and Yoru forget the whole thing happened and Nayuta warned Denji that every girl who gets involved with them ultimately tries to kill him, which that isn't too far off the mark. And we now, in hindsight, are seeing that that was foreshadowing for this very moment we have here. One of the students, it opens up the box where Denji's head is located and completely shocked that it's a human head and not the chains man head. And when Yoru says, hey, I don't care about any of that, she wants the head reattached, basically because she wants to strike down chains a man when he's at his full power. One of the students student speaks directly to Mitaka and this is where we get that sad violin music start playing. The moment of reckoning is finally here. When Yoru is shown Denji's face, it leads to one of the most powerful set of panels 
we've ever gotten in Chainsaw Man Part 2. The mark of a really good mangaka, a truly great mangaka, it isn't measured by the dialogue of the story or how fancy the designs look. I want you to forget all about that. I want you to forget about how the insane battle sequences look in something like Dragon Ball. Instead, it's the moments like this where the mangaka is able to tell you a whole story on a page without any action or any words or any narrator input. It's just expressions. My God, this is lovely. And I know Fujimoto's art style is something that can throw a lot of people off, but I think this right here shows the brilliance and the simplicity of Fujimoto's art. So we start with Yoru looking as cold as ever, detached, but her eyes, they are zeroed in. Then we see Denji's unconscious face where the guy looks like he just woke up from a really, really bad night of sleep before we see that Mitaka has taken over control again. And it continues to build on the theme of what we've been seeing with this whole rapidly switching on and off seemingly with seconds only passing with the two of them where they're continuously switching back and forth like we've seen in the last few chapters that panel of Mitaka that we see when she takes back over control that is the tell that something is coming whereas Yoru was shown with her mouth slightly open as if she was about to say something and her eyes were shown smaller narrowed focused and cold Mitaka's eyes they contrast them in the next panel they're now centered showing that the eyes they're beginning to widen but you can also see the hurt in her eyes from the way that the lines are drawn around her eyes and the bigger tell is that the way that her lips are slanted which further conveys the emotion and that's where we start getting that impact shot and i love the tears that we get here not literal tears but you can taste the sadness so that last panel shows mitaka with her eyes all the way widened you can see the little black dot in the middle and you can see that her eyes they went completely from from being shaded and black to being gray in appearance and her mouth is all the way open this was such a lovely scene to see unfold this is like one of those disaster videos that you watch where you know that the plane is about to crash you know that the roman rain spear is about to connect after the bloodline interfered in the match but even though you know it's coming you can't look away from it because on a certain level on a primal level human beings are drawn to violence and chaos it's why the romans would watch slaves and prisoners and blood sport matches at the Colosseum against each other or against lions and all tigers and all types of stuff is why the whole tragedy genre exists because as humans we look for that pain to a certain degree we seek it out we seek out uncomfortable situations Mitaka right here was drawn to pull out that emotion out of readers and it makes this low burning and slow building crescendo that we've been getting throughout Chainsman Part 2 with all the storytelling being more centered around building the characters through every everyday moments and struggles and not so much like the chaos and the action as you saw in part one it makes all that worth it now that's where we get the blue balls cliffhanger Quancy shows up ready to kill everyone in the room and this was hands down the correct decision to make a lesser writer would have been focused on the dilemma the melodrama of Mitaka and Yoru now that you know that Denji is Chainsaw Man that is a low-hanging fruit now that wouldn't be a bad route to go and sometimes the most obvious route is the correct one but the reason why I say that a lesser writer would do this is that you have to understand narrative bill on one hand you have been taking advantage of the dramatic irony this whole time to get readers to this moment it makes the scenes where we see denji telling me talk i'm really chains man on top of the school and yoru says well what if he is chains man and me says there's no way all those small moments where we saw that denji's secret should have been known to me and yoru now we finally see the characters in universe learn something that we've all known the beauty of dramatic irony but this is what a true writer understands sometimes you don't immediately give the readers exactly what they want when they want it because readers they don't know what they want until they get it readers are fickle which is why you continue to build and to tell the story as you envision it without altering because as long as the story has a journey that leads to a proper payoff the readers will forget what they thought they wanted because you showed them what they actually needed wants and needs and storytelling they operate the same way that they do in real life that thing that you want 
isn't necessarily what you need. Fujimoto shows a clear grasp of understanding that because just as your mind is reeling from that reveal, he yanks the rug out from underneath you before you can process what happened. Then he ends it off with the cliffhanger where you see Quan Si just standing there. You and the characters in universe, you're left going, oh boy, this is about to get crazy. These guys are in serious trouble. But you're also left wondering, what's going to be a reaction to Mitak and Yoru? Because when we saw the reaction, we knew that there was some heartbreak and some anger coming but now we're due to see it given to us later on. We can hear her reaction later on. That's the beauty of this whole situation. It gives us conflict with the reveal. It creates a moment where the internal struggle and the external struggle are at odds. And that's the thing that any storyteller worth their merit is always going for. A strong internal conflict and an even stronger external conflict that directly play off of each other. Mitaka has caught feelings for Genji. She might not be the only one, but she has to kill Chainsaw Man which also happens to be Denji, the boy she's in love with. She shares a body with the war devil, someone with a personal grudge with Chainsaw Man. Mitaka might be forced to hand over control to someone who wants to kill the boy she's in love with, and given that they've been swapping bodies back and forth, she might start resisting Yoru when it comes to this. This is exactly why you don't show the reaction now, because you can sprinkle this conflict throughout multiple chapters, and you can ride this one out. On a 1 to 10, I'm a 100 on how stoked I am right now. This hits harder than that belt that The Rock and Roman Reigns took turns hitting Cody with on Monday Night Raw. 